Hey, so here we are. Welcome back or welcome to the celebration day with Pencil First Games. I'm Jessica and I am here with a ton of awesome people here for our game design AMA. Um, I'm so excited. We have so many great people here. So why don't we go around and just introduce everybody who's here. Um, I don't know if we want to start just kind of going through just who's on name my Name a person and they'll start speaking. Well, let's let's go. Kim, <laughs> we'll start with you. And why don't we say who you are, what you've worked on, and maybe what your personal favorite game is. All right. Uh, my name's Kim Robinson, and I've known Ed for probably at least 10 years. We first started working together when he was at Tabula Digita doing some video games, educational video games. But our first board game we did together was uh, the original Liftoff and Siblings Trouble. And I've worked on those two and uh, most recently Floriferous and three or four other titles as well, plus a bunch of Kickstarters. And I, I think my favorite game has to be Liftoff, though, because it was the first thing I really saw that Ed had been working on. And I loved it. It's and and, and she really went on, she went on tour for that one. When we were <laughs> yeah, that's true. Two, two. Awesome. <laughs> nice. How about you, Mark? Uh, yeah, I uh, I'm a video game guy. I've been making games for uh, video games for 25 years or so now. Um, uh, I you started, started when you were like 10, right? Uh, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Does it look it now? Um, uh, <laughs> Yeah, I started a little company called Looking Glass, which made a uh, thief and system shock and that stuff. And I've been making video games for 25 years. Heroes Welcome is my first board game. Um, and uh, I also run a, a game design workshop at the Game Developers Conference every year. This was supposed to be the 20th year, but uh, Oof. it got postponed. Ah. Yeah. Hopefully next year, right? <laughs> next year, yeah. right? We'll still have a 20th one. Just take 21 years to do it. Yep. <laughs> Still 20 years, still counts. And what about your favorite game? Oh, my favorite. Uh, who has a favorite game? It's it's a tough one. Yeah, isn't it? Who has a favorite game? <laughs> um, gosh, uh, I'm not playing a lot of board games right now. I'm going to say Dungeons and Dragons, just because that's the nice. one I'm able to play with my nine year old. So there you oh, go. Fun, fun. <laughs> awesome. Um, let's go to Keith. Sure. Hey. Um. Uh, my name is Keith Mateka. I. I'm the designer and owner of Thunderworks Games. Um, and uh, uh, what was the question I was supposed to answer? <laughs> <laughs> game. Game. Uh, maybe, maybe what you worked on with Pencil. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah so I'm, uh, as a good friend, I've been working with him for quite a while. Started out doing uh, single player, player modes based on uh, Mr. C. Finn's multiplayer design. Um, and then I also designed a game called uh, Skulk Hollow with Ed. Um, which came out uh, last year or so. And uh, we're, you know, basically uh, Ed and I are just uh, good friends and he often times will call me and tell me how to run my business and give me all kinds <laughs> of advice whether I ask for it or not, um, which many of those things prove to be fruitful and some of them don't. But um, uh, so, you know, Ed and I are just good friends and, um, you know, and I've, I've worked um, as like uh, board games has been my full full time job for about two and a half years now. Uh, I worked for in video games for fifteen years before that. So, um, my favorite game of all time is a game called War of the Ring. Uh, part of the, you know, hopefully you're familiar with it, but it's this massive, you know, uh, scale game that I like quite a bit. Um, and then my favorite card game, thrown in a secondary here, oh. is uh, <laughs> Glory to Rome. Is my favorite card game of all time. Nice. It's amazing. Nice. Cool, cool. And the awesome. designer of role player. Let's keep. Yeah, going. I was gonna say you might know, you might have heard of this little yeah. thing called role play. <laughs> it's, uh, you know, some some people like it. <laughs> Just a few. <laughs> All right, let's go over to Steve Finn, Doctor Finn. Yeah, how's it going? I'm Steve Finn. I am the owner of Doctor Finn's Games, and uh, I've I don't know. I have a lot of Kickstarters now, like over twenty Kickstarter you, you campaigns. Are, you are... You've run a lot, man. You're in the yeah, top and, of Kickstarter creators. And I have a lot of games now, too. Like, it's over. It's almost 25 or 30. I lose track, you know. Yeah, it's um, true, right? And uh, so I've worked with uh, the Pencil First Games team on, what is it now, four? Five? five. <laughs> right? five. Yeah, you know, whatever it is. So we have Herbaceous, Herbaceous Sprout, Sunset Over Water, the Whatnot Cabinet, and then the hard-to-pronounce 
floriferous. <laughs> hey, man. That's, that's what's going to win. It's and hard I'll to pronounce just, and spell. That, and no, that's, great. that's a winning combination for a game title these days. It, no, it's fantastic. Um, I just <laughs> always have a hard time. Like, I have to concentrate when I say it. Um, <laughs> but soon enough, it will. when I say it enough, it'll come off uh, smoothly. The, the thing I want to let out of the bag, I guess, is Keith and I's relationship is like, I've only met him a couple of times. I met you once. He's like a nice guy, but we we have <laughs> zero true, zero true. interaction. We met at Pac Solo Club. stuff, which I think is really interesting. Like I give Ed the game, and then he gives it to Keith, and then Keith and I have no contact whatsoever. <laughs> right now, this is the closest <laughs> I've ever seen us. <laughs> Jeez. We met at Pac Solo <laughs> Club uh, last year. I'm sorry. Yo, no, I know. I mean, and, right. But in yeah, general, I yeah. was actually I mean, close. We were, we were shaking hands. Ed likes yeah. to control things. Yeah, yeah. Like, he wants to make sure that, like, <laughs> none of my <laughs> ideas make it over to your side and none of your ideas make it over to my yeah, side. Yeah, no, no. I, sure I, that, I, yeah. Um, I, nothing I like more is when you guys counter edit your own rules against each other. Uh, mm -hmm. that, that, uh, that's the best. But no, it's fun. No. But, um, my favorite game. I Yeah, I, I get bored very quickly with my favorite games but the kind i i usually say el grande if only because it's kind of a genre of a game that i kind of like and it's been around for a long time i'll never refuse a game Excellent. but i get bored very quickly of games <laughs> so i'm always <laughs> over three games like i never want to play the same game almost never you know mm -hmm. wow yeah well there's a lot to choose from though so there are new there favorite are. Yeah. every day that's what i'm saying <laughs> All right, let's go over to Sebastian. So Hello. Introduce yourself. Hello. Well, I'm, I'm Sebastian. I'm a graphic designer working in Skull Hollow and Legendary Creatures. Uh, I've been working in video games for 10 years prior to met Steve and started to work in a few board games that are developing a lot of cool stuff with Edo and with Steve too. Um, nice. what else? Uh, what about favorite game? How about favorite game? Yeah, I work a lot. I go work a lot in a game called The Sandbox, it was a really big hit. Whoa. Um, my favorite game from Pencil First is Sunset Over Water. That game awesome. sees a lot of table at, at home. Fantastic, fantastic. Awesome. Yep, lots of fun. And I saved. The best for last, I guess. Sure. That's Jeez, man. <laughs> hey, I've, I've, I've had the good fortune. I was thinking enough. we were just going to skip Ed. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That's, 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 that's what I would have done. I've just had the good fortune of working with all these folks. Uh, I was, before we like went live, I took a, a screenshot because like I've never really looked at all these people at the same time in this way before, which is pretty crazy. Um, but yeah, no, I mean, it, it, uh, obviously I run Pepper Force Games, but if, again, we've all, in many ways, like, like Sebastian has done work with Steve. I think Kim has done work with Steve. Keith has done work with me. I've done work with Keith. Like th there's a lot of overlapping projects right. one way or the other in this group. <laughs> um, so it's 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 been fun. But why don't we dive in? Yes, dive it into the questions. So how about we will go for the first one and I'm gonna put Keith, I'm gonna put you on the spot with this sure. one. <laughs> uh, your question sure. is do you design mechanics or a theme first? Uh, it depends on the game. Um, of the games that I've designed, like uh, the first game I designed was Mechanics First, um, where role player, which was called Bullfrogs, the second uh, role player was a uh, theme first. I mean, my, my general, I think this is pretty, people say this all the time, but to me, like, theme is what gets people in the door, and like the quality mechanics is what gets people to, you know, continue to play it and want to play it over and over again. Um, both are super critical, and the integration of those two things is super critical. So, um, I mean, you just look for good ideas, whether that good idea is a mechanic or that good idea is a theme. Like I'm just constantly looking for good ideas uh, or if Ed just sends me random good ideas. Which happens sometimes. Um, you got to get on some of those. Just saying. Um, uh, so then e either one is fine. Um, but, and, and they're both, they both, you know, both methodologies are, are great. But I, um, I would say I've been doing more theme first stuff lately, but if I fell into some random mechanic, I would definitely chase it. And then afterwards come up with 12 different themes and try to figure out which ones fit the best and which ones I was excited about and then kind of apply it uh, after the fact. Right. Into there. Nice, great answer. Awesome. And actually I'm curious, because I, I think I know the answer, but then I, then I, I, I actually don't know if I've asked. Steve, you're, you're mechanics first mostly, right? 
Yeah. The way, I mean, the way, yeah, the way, well, I've changed, you know, the way that I think about it this way is I might have some really loose theme that just gets me in the door. It's an excuse for what mechanics I'm going to use, but anybody who plays any of my games knows that almost all of them can be just changed. The theme can be changed and it's still going to be the same game. I don't, I don't really care that much about theme integration. It's not, personally what I do like I never feel like when I playing a game like I never actually feel like I'm immersed in a world I always just see it as little pieces pushing things around like a chess game mm -hmm. so that's just the way I mean that's the way my mind is set so I always am thinking mechanics first although that you know I, I love the way that we actually started our working relationship um, you know I tell this story all the time but Ed had done some reviews for some of my games and we discovered that he you grew up in a in the town basically that I was living in, right? Oh no, or you were close to close to close to you were close to it, right. And so he was coming back because one time we met up and then he showed me these great cards from Beth Sobel and said, basically, can you like make a game with this? <laughs> and that's the kind of that's kind of like what the way I would operate. It'd be like, all right, I've got some stuff. What am I going to, you know, what mechanics? Yeah, pro mm -hmm. problem solving game yeah. design. Nice. Cool. But awesome. it wasn't like, hey, I really want to make a game about herbs, or I really want to make a game about <laughs> medieval monks, or I want to make a game about, you know, whatever. It's just, it's a very, it's an excuse to, to put mechanics together for me. Great. Awesome. How about, so we have game design, but also on this in our AMA here are graphic designers, which I think is, sometimes another part of the puzzle that not everybody knows about. So Kim, I'm going to ask this one of you. Okay. What things does a graphic designer add to the product? Well, um, you know, really there is no product until a graphic designer gets involved. Mm -hmm. I mean, you've got a great idea. You're going to have some beautiful illustrations, but someone has to put that all together and send it to a printer to be produced. And that's really what we do. But, you know, Ed uh, I've worked with a lot of different clients over my time being a graphic designer, which is a long time at this point. <laughs> Ed is spectacularly buttoned up. He is very organized and it makes, you know, doing our job a lot easier, but he's also really picky. He wants to do like 500 variations on something, which drives me crazy. <laughs> But seven, seven, but seven, Kim. Like, I don't know how much they've actually oh, spoken before. They're that's like, pretty good. Yeah, the, the <laughs> like, you're describing Ed like I would describe Ed right now. Not enough for you to, to put it is two a of us together, I think. <laughs> so it is a lot of fun. In the end, I, I have to say, I'm really proud of every project I've worked on with Ed because he is so uh, demanding about it. He wants it to be excellent at the end. So we get a great product. And it's fun to be part of it and look at it and go, this was this was a great thing to do. And it also takes like a year. That's another thing people maybe don't know is that it is a long time to get through a whole project. You have to kind of be, um, uh, you know, focused in on it for a lengthy period of time. Yeah, but it's mostly fun. Good, good to know. Awesome. Yeah. Sebastian, did you have anything you wanted to add to that one as well? Yeah, uh, I'm alone <laughs> with, with Kim, you know what she said, but also, <laughs> With graphic design is where things start to become real, you know? The, everything is in, in people's mind and people have tested it, but is this a cool looking game or are we getting the, mes the message across perfectly? Shows up right when you start working. So it's like uh, not only doing things look cool, but the, all the iterative process to, to make things polished happens when you start to, to lay hand on that. Um, that's why it's, the importance is not only to someone who can make things look good, but make integrate things into something that becomes good. Cool. Yeah, I, what, 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 I, what I would have there, I, I thank you all for the organization. It's, it's nice for Keith to hear that because he's the guy. True, you guys. <laughs> he's like, Ed is the most disorganized person I've ever met. Oh. I was like, a little bit more attention to detail, buddy. Come on. Yeah. He's like, <laughs> what are you guys talking about? Um, so, so at least he got to hear it from somebody else. But no. How much are you he, paying these people? Yeah. He, 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 <laughs> what, 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 I, what I think was worth adding on the graphic design side, um, it's really the communication layer between the game and the player, right? It's, it's, it's the UI and the graphic design is what 
makes the experience playable and transparent and, and work with the human mind. And so I think solving, whether it's the iconography or the flow of the image with the, the content on top, the font, the format, those are the things that make it very playable. And great graphic design makes graphic design transparent, right? You're just playing. You're not confused or lost or whatever. Yeah. Think, think um, about the games that you've played with bad graphic design. Right. right. Mm -hmm. it's, um, not going to pick on any, any in particular, but think about <laughs> like how you've experienced graphic design failures in a game. And uh, you know maybe that'll help you appreciate you know, graphic design successes in other games. Mm -hmm. Definitely. That's a good, good point. Uh, how about, let's see, we jump into another question. It's from chat. So hello to everybody who's watching right now on Facebook and Twitch. Uh, one question we had was, where do you start coming up with a plan for solo versions of a game? I think that's a Keith question. Oh, yeah, I was going to say, it's probably Keith. <laughs> Before I answer how this question, I just wanted, I did want to note on the graphic design side, like I think it's like the graphic designers are like the unsung heroes of all these projects, right? So they are like, uh, the graphic design work is like, it always, it, there's always a lot more graphic design work to get these things done than there are from the illustrator's perspective. And then when when buy, when people pick it up, it's like they, they look at the pretty picture that the illustrator did, but like, the amount of work that the graphic designer does in terms of like preparing files for submission and then just getting everything going together. I, like, I mean, I'm definitely my, it's, you know, I'm a, I grew up, well, not grew up. I still, I'm, I'm a bass player at the end of the day. Like I went to school for music and like, to me, like the graphic designers are like the, are like the bass players in your favorite rock band. It's like without them being there, the whole thing would fall apart, but nobody really notices. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> That's really sweet. I'm, good. Bass, I'm a bass player. Yeah. There, there you have it. <laughs> Whoa, 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 whoa. Oh, that, that, that was cool. It just like came up on, on screen, right? Yeah, that was crazy. Tim had something to say. So the question about solo uh, game design. Um, so the, my general philosophy is um, the, when you're starting to work on a solo version of a game, the, you, the way, place you don't want to go is where like you have a totally different game that uses the same components. Like you want to try to, you analyze the multiplayer version of the game and you figure out where the, the decision points are and where the, like, the interesting pieces are. And then um, you, you know, you try to basically emulate those in some other kind of out of way because there's obviously nobody else at the table. So the, the first place I look at is like figuring out where the interesting decision points are. I, I analyze like which which parts of the game just like aren't going to work solo and those those are going to go away. Um, and then once I have that up and running, then I end up trying to add in like a bell or whistle to kind of make the solo mode just a little special. So it's supposed to feel like the multiplayer game with like something a little cool and, and special for the solo, the solo person. So um, there's other like, like general philosophies about playing uh, solo games or like, I don't want a ton of administration to do for this AI character because I want to be playing the game as a solo player, not like playing this random robot stuff all the time. Mm -hmm. um, and then just like ease of play. And um, there's, you can also get into like, what is the target in terms of how you want um, want people to, to be scoring the game because there's kind of two general methodologies okay. one being you know get a high score which is kind of considered the old school way of doing it a little bit and then there's like playing against an ai uh where you're trying to beat them and there's some kind of variable difficulty so you can like set your difficulty and try to beat them the problem with um the problem with the ai methodology is oftentimes to implement that you end up kind of going against that whole flow of play and like ease of use, like to, to implement a real kind of uh, intelligent AI that, you, that is really satisfying, it ends up being kind of uh, encumbered by a ton of administrative stuff, which I personally hate. So um, trying to figure out which one of those two paths you kind of want to go down um, and then and, and seeing like if the AI path is tenable or if maybe we're going to stick with the, the high score, which... Um, at the end of the day, I think is easier for kind of casual players to understand. It's like they're familiar with playing video games, getting a high score on Pac-Man. They can play this game and they understand the idea of getting a high score in this game as well. Um, so I don't know if that answers the question, but there's some random uh, solo design. Yeah. Well, actually, I, I was thinking it's a little off, off, off uh, platform, so to speak. But Mark, like you've worked on some exceptionally fantastic single player video games right right and so when when you're when I, you're I like, thinking i'd like to think so yeah well, i said it um <laughs> but what, like you know is when you're thinking about 
like, do you think there's any lessons that you can take from sort of video game single player experiences, which are, you know, the, the computer's doing a lot of stuff, right? Yeah. So there's a lot of that. Is it, but are there any nuggets you think that are, are worthwhile or you like like single player experiences in board games you like that draw from video games at all? Or do you think it's just the complexity of the, all of the back end stuff makes that not so possible? Well, I mean, I think in, in video games, one of the things you have that you kind of don't have, in, although you could have in board games, is like content-based games, right? Like a game like Thief, right? Or a game like Half-Life, um, is it's got a level design, right? It's got, you know, it's got a bunch of content created by somebody for you to consume. And pretty much you are consuming it, right? Like you're, you get through it and you're done. Like you could imagine, like you know, like a scenario book kind of single play mode for a game. I don't know if anyone's ever done that where it's sort of like, okay, take this flip over the next page of the book and then do what the AI says is doing. And then you just keep doing it. You can imagine something like that. I don't know. Has that ever been done? I don't know. Um, I, I think, I mean, there's okay. been versions. Some, I mean, certainly in, in longer legacy game. I mean, I think you can play Gloomhaven single player, right? Sure. So, so that would, I mean, though it's not really built that way, but it's sort of that idea of like. Yeah. I mean, well, Gloomhaven is a co op game, right? Right. So, I mean, lots of co op games. Probably not Hanabi, but lots of co op games can play single player. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah really yeah, yeah. play right. some of those, some of the multiverse single player. Really mm -hmm. Right, right, right. But um, focus, on, focus on a single, that single player adventure. Right, experience. right. Yeah. So, but I think maybe in the sort of old school, um, old school arcade game kind of world where you're just kind of creating like these ramps, um, you know, like a defender or something like that, where you're just kind of creating a formula that for escalating challenge, right. That, um, you know, that people can, I mean, maybe there's something there like uh, the Agricola uh, app, right. Has their single player mode where it's not just beat your high score, but it's also beat your high score and carry over some persistent stuff from the last game. Right. Um, you know, so there's like some escalating challenge and also that. Yeah, those are um, the great benefits of, of of a digital game where you, right. you know it can remember these things for you mm -hmm. and, and it can it can take care of all that administrative stuff that like a single player board game player has to do manually. Um, there's a million. Right. There's a, there's been a million times in my life when I was working on a single player game. I'm like. You know, this would be a hell, hell of a lot easier if it was. <laughs> with, yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. yeah. And yeah. If, if we want to go cool. off of that, uh, that idea of digital games, even um, some of the questions in chat and another question we had before was, how has this year changed how you design and develop games? And are you more concerned about how it looks online now? Are you paying more attention to that? Um, because, again, 2020 <laughs> changed everything. Ed, you want to change, you want to say that one? Steve, you, you, working I can, what, are you, what are your I thoughts? Can, on that? I can I can talk about that a little. Yeah. Well, one thing that it's actually done, uh, I'm not exactly answering the question, but it's really improved um, my ability to make games more quickly. Um, as if I'm not making them quickly enough. But the 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 fact is now I have play testers all over the country. Mm -hmm. So I can just load up a game and we can play test it. I've also pitched games now uh, to publishers, you know, the ones that I'm not going to publish myself, um, you know, or Ed and I on Monday, we're going to be play testing and doing a little bit more stuff. So I think it's actually, it's really helping the development of games because you can get more uh, opinions from different people. It's easier. And the other thing you get to do is, because it's kind of harder to play the game online, um, I think it warns you of things that might slow down in real life. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, like, oh, this is taking a long time, and then you have to figure out, is this taking a long time because we're just online, or is it taking a long time the other way? Um, as far as, like, designing a game, I think on the side of production, you have to be really careful because the, the platform is different than in person. And I mean, just as an example, we just uploaded the Floriferous um, game and <laughs> table, Tabletopia. And the game is beautiful in print. You know, you print out a card and you look on that and it's still beautiful online, but it's actually, it becomes harder to play because the iconography is hard to see. Um, and so I, I tried to upload my butterfly garden into Tabletopia and I can't do it. It's, it's, 
I would have to redesign all the cards, mm -hmm. all the whole look of the game to make the game playable in the, in, in that environment. Yeah. I, the, um, the, the, the Fuller is so undersold how great the game looks and feels. We exactly. were like, we're not showing it. I mean, I'll show it in my hands or something, but we're right, not, right. I'm not going to put a tabletopia up right now because it just, it's just underwhelming to the point where it's like, forget it. It's just not working right now. And, 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 and I, I think it's not, it, it may, uh, well, we'll find out if it's really playable, but for all, it, some games, to, in order to be playable, you really just have to have things pop out. And in, in real life, these things can pop out because of the great work of people like Kim and Sebastian, right? Mm -hmm. um, but the design inside of a online environment is very different. Colors are different. The sizes of things look different and, right. you know, like, so you have to readjust it. And what, what mm -hmm. I've been noticing is like, I can't believe certain people like haven't, it, it seems like they're just uploading the games on Tabletopia and they're not really playing them because mm -hmm. they're not recognizing certain kinds of things. And I don't know if people mm -hmm. have noticed this, like one thing that drives me nuts is the overhead view and like the meeples that stand you know, around right. from yeah. over here, you can't see them. Yep. Lay them down. <laughs> right, right. You know, we're making them in a card. The other thing people don't know how to deal with is polynomial calling, calling games uh, because they don't know how to deal with the missing corners. And so anybody out there Ooh. that designs things, that my trick is to make them all cards and not mm -hmm. tiles because then the cards will lay flatter on each other. Uh, but there's things like that, that as you design the games and, uh, whether tabletop simulator or tabletopia mm -hmm. you realize and it's a very different it's a different space that requires different graphic design different choices of components and mm -hmm. all that yeah and is there anything on the graphic design side that has that 2020 has kind of changed your process sebastian or kim uh, not oh. really. I mean, no. you know, like as a freelancer, I've worked out of my house forever. Um, you know, there's been some technology improvements in this last mm -hmm. year, just like this, for example, mm -hmm. is an interesting experience yeah. just to see everybody for real. And, you know, in real time has been, you know, it's been a fun experience today. But um, my regular job is basically the same. <laughs> so, like, just do what yeah. Ed tells I, you. I didn't even have to <laughs> 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 One of the things, I just do what she tells me. Yeah. <laughs> so one of the things that happened for me is, uh, you know, COVID became a forcing function. function. I finally was like, okay, I got to get this on Tabletop Simulator because otherwise it's just never going to get played again, mm -hmm. right? Um, and so I just sat down and did it. Now I'm a video game developer, so it's like I can script all the stuff and do all the yep. stuff. Right? Like I'm pretty capable of that. Yeah. And then one of the things I did, I mean, and it, it's funny. I went to, I actually got a VR headset and I looked at my game that I had made on VR and like. I made the all the components giant. It turns out, like if you like, you look at it in 3D, and it's like, oh my god, I made like, the <laughs> super version of the game because that's I just made it, tried to make it look better, right? But one of the things, um, one of the things that's interesting about uh, the uh, the online virtual tabletop world is it's harder to um, deal with state that's just in the players' heads, right? Like whose turn it is. <laughs> Uh, and stuff like that. Um, and so like one of the things is I actually hired Kim to make a, we, I have a component in the virtual version of, uh, of uh, Here is Welcome that's not in the physical box, which is just a token that you can grab to say, I want to end the round, right? Like, so rather than, mm -hmm. rather than having like, oh, we're on our voice chat saying, I want to end the round. Well, what if somebody's not on voice chat, whatever. Like just having some way to memorialize that in a visualizable state uh, was more important. Uh, on the virtual tabletop than it was on the on the real right. tabletop. Mm -hmm. so, uh, so that's an example of stuff. Nice. Um, I, I oh, go ahead, Keith. Well, I was going to talk about kind of from a publisher's perspective, like, um, you know, like I know like there's been all this, there's been lots of advancement, a lot more people playing digital and stuff. But at least for me personally, at the end of the day, I just don't really like playing games uh, ver digitally very much. Mm -hmm. So um, it's impacted my um enthusiasm for receiving pitches from people because usually i like to have pitches in person uh, a lot of that is because i want to meet the game designer and mm -hmm. kind of be able to you know just to having that 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 face to face experience right. and like does does the the zoom chat and, and the tabletop simulator game replace that kind of you know um mm -hmm. so like in the in 2020 i've been um especially because i you know the in 2019 i went to 
12 conventions and it's like mm-hmm. in 2020 i went to two and you know in february and march yeah so i was i'm at home a lot more i'm in the yeah. office a lot more so i can i've just been executing on the things that kind of were already done or really close to being done mm-hmm. um with the hope that like in 2021 like i can kind of get back in gear um i mean there's, there's no shortage of titles on my on my docket um but like the ones that don't need as much development those kind of push to the front of the line because i can execute on the publication of those things without um as much play testing because play testing is hard right now mm-hmm. and uh, some people love digital play testing i struggle with it personally and i, I we still do it and i will often kind of times like you know for, you know uh have contractors do additional play testing uh as well but um yeah so that's kind of how it's affected my my company in terms of just like reorganizing what's coming out when. And then um, I've been able to really focus on, uh, I actually have quite a few titles coming out in 2021 because I've been able to kind of just sit in my office and work on all these games. Um, Yeah, except except when the distributors are like, stores don't want new games, they want old classics. (laughs) Um, The the hope is that in 2021, they want some new games again. No, yeah, yeah, for sure. And I I do think it's interesting. Like, it was great to hear Steve be so excited about it because there, I really do see when I talk to folks that sort of split. Some people are like, this is mm-hmm. awesome. This is like connected me and made it so much easier to do all these things in sort of one category. And another category is like, this is awful. I, 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 it's a struggle every moment. I, I hate it. I, w- I was curious what I was going to ask before he started to Sebastian. You were working, uh, doing a lot of work with IDW and some other larger publishers like Fantasy yeah. Flight earlier. But like, um, you know, we're all like indie small, small groups of people. When you were working with this year working with some of those other big companies did it feel natural with them was it more challenging like how would you describe it on a, on a, in the scale of a larger organization i think you're still the, the best organizer the guy i know mm-hmm. <laughs> you gotta yeah, work this, you, do, you need to have him do a game with you so you can you can just show me up <laughs> um, well, okay, well but I, no, no, okay. I worked with sebastian uh, i'm taking with that yeah, with some videos from him yeah, uh, for dual powers, his wife did okay. a video, like Kickstarter oh, video for Okay, us. so the question, I don't mean organization. I mean about virtual tabletopia. Do uh, you, yeah. is it all just passing <laughs> files back and forth? Or did or, or did you use, the, are you, as a graphic designer doing lot of these projects, yeah. do you ever use tabletopia and tabletop simulator as a tool in communicating? Or is it still just send yeah. me the files and the game and I'll? Well, uh, it depends because on... <laughs> Smaller publishers, it's more common to be the, the guy that makes the decisions to be involved in how the game works. So usually you see face-to-face the guy that's behind all this. In bigger companies, you have like a lot of layer, uh, like the producer, the boss of the producer, and some bosses I don't know because I never get to, to deal with them. So sometimes you, you get... Uh, a basic idea if the designer is involved, but sometimes they just deliver the, the game and they move out. So I still think that the organization is even tighter. Uh, when I say you are one of the most organized, you not solely because you are uh, <laughs> trying to, to look okay, but because in the process of being such involved in the final product, you have to take out. Uh, the dialogue, the, the talking every day is closer. It's, it's a little more packed. Uh, uh, it feels more like a team. For example, right, I, right. Work, I work in a few games for Fantasy Flight. They are awesome to work. They are super organized. They have everything just in point. But I don't get to know the whole theme because the theme is huge. They have someone who only do rule books. Someone who, like me, do the creative side, but not the production side. So you are like, you feel more like a little piece in the big machine. Mm-hmm. Uh, when you have a, um, a mid-sized publisher, I think it's the, the ideal way to, to feel the love. You yeah. can get some stuff, but you feel the love more. Yeah, it's interesting, the board game companies versus video games. I mean, a lot of us have backgrounds in video games. They tend to have that sort of team-centric approach from my my experience uh but cool can i can i just add in one thing about this topic um because kim and i uh maybe last week or something this was the first or second time now i've met with a graphic designer on you know on zoom or whatever it was we used um and i loved it because i was able to 
describe the board because I felt like this particular board that I'm working on needed a particular kind of thing, and I was able to much more easily describe it in person, which I'd never ha never had that before. So now I feel like I'm working on another game. I feel like anytime and I there's anything at all that's even questionable, I'm just going to say, "Can we meet on online and talk about it?" Whereas in the past, it would always be I'm typing on an email, you know. Like, can you make it so that you do this? And it's like a 90 degree, I want a 90 degree angle with like that thing in the back. And, and you can't, ex, you know, it's hard to explain things in words mm -hmm. uh, on, you know, in, in print. Yeah. So the, the conversation, I felt like the conversation with Kim in like 10 minutes saved it's me efficient. like two hours. Mm -hmm. It was very efficient. It was like, boom, this is what I need. Yeah. Though interestingly, interestingly, that's something you could have done four years ago. No, right? exactly. Like, yeah, yeah. Yeah, 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 this is more like, <laughs> like you know, no, no, but no, now everyone's, cool everyone's just so this, used right? to, oh, hit join meeting. Oh, hit this. Oh, mm -hmm. like the video chat and video conferencing as a function of like a calendar invite or a button, like you're in Discord or in Slack and you just hit talk. I, I think that's really how, how it's become so transparent and easy to do. Yeah. And I think it's a lot about just like user familiarity, mm -hmm. right? So the, the pandemic has forced everybody to learn how to do this. And now everybody knows how to do it, you know? So whereas right. in before yeah. there was like friction and barrier to entry for people who just wasn't familiar with that, that those, those, uh, that technology. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But now everybody's using it. Yeah. <laughs> We're all used to it. Uh, so we talked about Keith, you already said you have like 5 million projects in 2021 coming out. Right. So, <laughs> but maybe Probably we, four or five, but yeah, yeah. Four or five. <laughs> a little more reasonable. <laughs> But uh, if we want to go through and just talk about what everybody's currently working on, what's coming up, uh, what you're excited about, we can kind of go around and just hear from everybody, get your pitches. <laughs> so we can start. Uh, where do we start? How about Mark? And they, and they don't have to be like don't and they don't have to be pencil first games things, right? Like whatever yeah. you guys. Are yep, working. whatever you're working on. <laughs> so you 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 call me. I, I'm putting you on the spot, Mark. All right. So uh, <laughs> you know, obviously, I have a day job, uh, but. Um, I've been working on a uh, space battle PvP roll and write. Cool. Um, uh, with asymmetric ships. Um, uh, I spent a, a fair amount of time um, trying to build. Um, I built the game sort of digitally, not with any graphic design or anything, but so that I can. Uh, I built an AI to play it against itself oh, nice. so that I can uh, balance the asymmetric ships against each other. And I've had mixed success with that. But um, <laughs> yeah, that's uh, that's kind of what I'm what I'm up to. Nice, sounds awesome. How about Steve? What are you working on? Uh, right now, I'm working on I think like six games. Um, the way that I'm now moving Doctor Finn's is I'm going to have one big Kickstarter a year for the following line of games. So uh, in the summer, I had a Kickstarter for for my 2021. And I'm also going to use all the same size box and they're all going to be around the same price so that I could just make the Kickstarter really streamlined and just say, you get one game for this amount, two games for this amount, three games for this amount and all that. So I've constrained myself to a certain number of components and all that. Uh, these constraints actually work really well with my, my uh, relationship with Ed and Pencil First Games because they're still the same kind of smaller box, not a whole lot of components, you know, 20 to $30, whatever, 40, you know, like that price range. You know, I'm never going to make a $60 game for at least Dr. Finn's. So right now I'm working on four games for my 20, uh, 22 line. Uh, Sebastian's actually working on one of them. Cam is working on one, possibly two um, with me uh, as well. And I'm also Ed and I are working on Floriferous, and yeah, yeah. So and it's a super for for those on the Kickstarter scene and otherwise. I think it's a super interesting model. I mean, you did it with the one your the, that first that four games you did like whatever a month ago or two months ago for 2021, maybe three. Um, but with the desire to like still need the the support on the Kickstarter, but also the complication of running a bunch of them. I think it's a very interesting. I don't know of anyone else that are doing it this way except for like Calliope Games did the like titans of gaming one right. which i don't know whatever happened with maybe they're still shipping games on that one but it's an interesting approach for sure yeah, well like, you know i've been doing this a long time and i this is actually now made it possible for me to because i'm right now in the process of shipping it's made it possible for me to do a better job of duty-free shipping around the world because i you know my my projects never really broke a thousand backers 
despite how many I had and all the reviews of positive stuff. So I'd end up having like, you know, 30 games going to Australia and you just can't have that much. Uh, I mean, that few and still make it viable. But now I've multiplied all the numbers by four and now I'm shipping like 400 games to Australia. And that actually then now makes it all possible mm -hmm. um, or a thousand games to Europe yeah. as opposed to 250. So I, I think yeah. this is going to work. Let's just hope that the shipping, <laughs> I don't know if anybody <laughs> saw that. That picture of the shipping of the ship recently, oh. that <laughs> the yeah, container. Oh, I was, oh. Sure my was like, a, no, it's real, <laughs> it's real. That's and right. I was like, That's oh, right. you know, I'm glad I got insurance. I know it's a, you know, it's a, the availability bias for those oh who are God. familiar with this. You know, you see something, it's like you, you're worried now about it, but. Um, that's why I now have insurance for all my containers. Yep, makes sense. <laughs> <laughs> so we have about five minutes left if we want to well, get I, through. I, 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 let, let, oh, let's hear what Keith is. Keith, uh, oh, yeah. same same thing, but what games same are you working thing, on, yeah. Keith? Right, I'm, wanna, I'm curious here. I'll tell you what you mean. So, <laughs> all right. So Role Player Adventures, I ran a Kickstarter for last summer. That's coming early summer. Super, like, big box games, $130 MSRP. So nothing that Mr. Finn would ever do, but it's, it's a huge narrative game that I worked on for a very long time and I'm very close to. Um, Cartographer's Heroes is the follow-up to Cartographers that ran a Kickstarter in the fall. That's coming in early summer as well. Uh, there's a new title from a designer named Eric Moso called Kate May, which is about Kate May, New Jersey uh, in, the, in the 1900s. It's like an economic city building game on the coast of New Jersey. Um, and that's at the printers right now, so that that will not go to Kickstarter. But that's there's a, a follow up to a game called Lockup. It's the um, expansion for Lockup called currently called Breakout that we're working on. So that'll probably go to Kickstarter in the spring. Um, and then I, there's there's a couple other uh, unannounced titles that are in the role player universe that aren't like that are mechanically like uh, divorced from everything else that's in the mm -hmm. universe that are coming. So that's exciting. Nice. Um, and we're starting to work on the, th the second expansion for role player adventures. So maybe that'll go to Kickstarter next year. We'll see. So, um, and then there's also a game uh, called theme parks that uh, we're trying to finish up with Vincent Dutre mm -hmm. on art. That's about building theme parks. It's like a, um, a medium light uh, Tetronimo game, mm -hmm. um, but it's got some cool bits to it for sure. And, and you should check that out. Awesome. There's probably other things yeah. I think about. Keith has been a, busy. <laughs> he always is. He always is. Yeah. So what about uh, Kim and Sebastian? I know we, we kind of had some crossover with, with some of the projects you were working on, but anything else you're excited about that's coming up next year that we didn't well, touch on? Well, anything that... is floriferous. So yeah. that's, you know, that's going to be a, a, like a month of doing the rule book here in the box. That's, my, that's the biggest thing on my plate right now, but I know there's more coming from Ed and we briefly talked about a few projects, but mm -hmm. that'll be down the road. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Awesome. And Sebastian, did you have anything else? Yeah, you can check the Batman the Animated Series board game that oh, we'll yeah. see, see the light next, next year, I hope. Um, awesome. It was like a big game. It so, took most of my year, but I'm really proud of that. <laughs> awesome. And Ed, did you have anything else you wanted to get out there? I mean, I yeah, I'll just I'll just pl <laughs> I'll just quickly plug what's what's coming up from Pencil First then. So uh, I forgot yeah, to <laughs> oh, no, I didn't want to, I, I didn't want everyone to just talk about. It. I, I was much more interested in your answers that you gave. Um, no, so for Pencil First, there's Foliferous that with Steve and Kim, and eventually once we're done, we'll pass it over to Keith so those guys can't talk with each other. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and so at that, we also have um, the 100 Tory Diverging Path expansion, which is uh, with Scott Caputo, who couldn't make it to this chat, and Vincent Dutrait, which is fantastic. And the big one, which we're going to show off later, is Mall Peak, um, which is a standalone equivalent sized sequel to Skulk Hollow that you can play separately or together or mix and match. Sebastian's doing the graphic design. Keith doing the design. That's a, a big one. Every opportunity for Keith to continue to point out how disorganized and uh, not attention to detail. <laughs> I, I, I just want better. That's the <laughs> he always wants better. He always wants better. But that's why it's so good. Because yeah. he wants better. Um, but anyway, so th those are really the big projects. Apparently, um, 
I'm looking into a um, holiday themed herbaceous uh because uh, that came up this morning and so now we have a path to that if we want to do it it's not done it's not done yeah yeah but um, like, i want to get paid again yeah let's do it um and then you know there's a couple other on the horizon projects i'm super excited about one is uh expanded deluxe edition of the siblings trouble which has a bunch of new content and uh, it's a big it's a fa favorite game that doesn't fit any category well enough to be a success but i'm still gonna gonna do it anyway Go um but then also a big game, Time Empire, with uh, another one with Vincent Dutre and um, Sebastian. So I'm excited about that. Nice. Awesome. Sounds like we're going to have a good 2021. <laughs> Let's hope so. Yeah. <laughs> For this year. Really, it's got to be better than this year. So it's we're be. just going to push into it. <laughs> the bar is pretty low. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Well, that's about it. We we hit the the end here, um, but it has been great talking with everybody. I learned a lot, had a lot of laughs. Um, it's been wonderful. And thank you to everybody who tuned in, asked questions, um, and just was involved in this. Uh, we're really excited about this community. And like you see here, I mean, people in this industry are approachable. You know, we, lo we love to talk about games. <laughs> so <laughs> this has been great. Um, anybody else have anything else in closing to add to this? Just thanks to everyone for yeah. taking time out of your weekend to participate. I appreciate it. Yeah, it was thanks. a lot of fun. Awesome chat. Yep. Really insightful. Thanks to Ed for running this awesome company and, and getting this awesome group of people together. Yeah. Bravo. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Sorry. Thanks, thanks everybody. <laughs>